boring spin. All right. Consent to that, my friend. We are live on your YouTube channel. I'm going to tweet you, and then you're going to retweet it before we rock and roll today. Got it. Let me find this. Uh, okay. Live live stream. Good. Beautiful. <laughs> All right. Yep. Working good. I even hear me. Excellent. Let me get my little standby cue card out of here, just in case I need it. And I actually, I got smart. It took me 200 and something episodes to realize, write the tweet before you have the link and then just drop the link and send so I don't have to write it on the fly. Like it took me right. 20 years to realize I could write the tweet like before I go live and just drop in the link, which I'm doing right now. So All right. Let me, there you uh, go. One to grow on. I'm always evolving. Take a note. Right. Here comes that okay. link. I know it's coming. There it is. There it is. Uh, Everything's so instant. You, you know what? By the way, uh, two nights ago, I was at Cafe Diplomatico. Why didn't you give me a call? I, well, I was because I was meeting Chris Brown and his brother-in-law David Ryder from the Toronto Star. Why didn't you call? I live. I live three doors away. No, in hindsight, I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> I would have walked by and said hello. I haven't seen you in person. Ne in a next, while. I could have given you something. Well, next that, time that I, I have promise, for you, you have because I I did I have something that, for you. I did get Nate's soap and I showered with it multiple times and I've never smelled so good. I know, eh? And I your skin, and your skin feels good too. I'm not scratching but, as much. It's uh, yeah, it's great. My bathroom smells good. Like I can just, it's just so arom aromatic. Is that a word? It is exactly a word. Wow. I'm, even that I'm improving. Okay, so let me just open up the uh, YouTube so I can see comments in real time here. Let's see here. Did you retweet that, Mr. Hebshire? No, I'm trying to come up with something. Uh... Oh, something clever? For, why start now? Now, come on, Mike. Uh, I'm feisty today. Uh, Canada's up four. I, I want you to be feisty. I don't want to hear anything about the Olympics. Okay? Why? No, I just don't want to hear. Literally it. the only sports no, I've no, watched. No, 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 no. We have to think. Like of you're boycotting it? Or, no, no, we're not here to, go, to give live oh. updates. We're here to put a good show together. Not to be distracted well, by something. What's the point of being on. live? That then? makes no sense. What do you mean? It's, it's happening it's now. Just, I mean, it's not I mean, an like, update. Look, it's, I'm just, yeah. I mean, it's, it's your show, but I don't, no, I that's 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 just, okay. you're ruining your, what? everything that you're saying that's not being recorded that no one can listen to is a waste of good shit. What's on YouTube? It's all a, it's all a waste of, no, no, what we're talking about here that no one's listening to is a waste of good shit. Are we on live yet? Are we on? Can anyone yeah. hear us? Did, did you did you retweet? There won't be a link until we're live. So once you see I tweeted a link, we're live, buddy. We're we're live. People are watching. I see Mike Kerr is watching. Gene People Belaitis, are watching right now. They're watching. Paul Hockyard, Wayne Brown, other. KM, Peter Demarco. Jesus fucking Christ! Holy cow! Scott Allen. I was all set to like you know put the standby thing up here, but no one's all right. Let's go. No back. man, uh, they're, they're, it's like a chicken and egg. You can't have a link until you're live. Yeah, the other thing is too is you can't fucking line up outside a store and expect to you know be served until that store opens. <laughs> kind of, I don't know what the fuck. I'm Hold on, I got to I got to think on that one for a minute. Hold on. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's too much. It's too early for that one. My but, okay. mind, my mind isn't not like like I'm prepared for nine a.m. No live update. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Like I used to do a live show every night, five nights a week, thousands of times. You're geared for a certain, if you peak too early, you're screwed. Like Ally Afraidy used to be ready 20 minutes before puck drop. Right. Fuck, he was ready to go. He would have scored four yeah. goals in four minutes. By the time puck drop came in, it's, yeah, that's he was over caffeinated. He had sweated out, you know, buckets full of. I'm sure that was crazy. caffeine. I'm sure that was caffeine. Whatever the case, you have to, you got to be. You, you can't be at your absolute 100% best when you start. You kind of work up to that. So I want to be at 79% at the beginning. Oh. And I'll be at 100% by three minutes in. Can you dig that? I'll let, I just want to tell you what Gene Velitis just wrote on your YouTube channel. And we're going to go live in one minute. But he wrote, uh, we're turning into the old married couple. So let's keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's our goal here. We haven't seen each other in person in, I don't know, how long is it since well, I was well, in your you backyard? Were here, you were, oh, in the in backyard. backyard. You're right. Well, it's been a while. You're right. You're right. It's been a while, right? And you were, you were how far from me and didn't even like bring 50 me meters. Up. 50 meters. Mike, uh, I guarantee you, Mike, if I was within two kilometers of your house, I'd like, hey, man, I'm in the neighborhood. You know, I fucked that up. I was, I, you were uh, 200 feet. You were 200 feet from my house. <laughs> I, <laughs> fucked, I fucked that up next, right. next time for sure, because we're Mike. doing that again. Okay, buddy. Nine o'clock. Let's, okay, let's All go. All right. So let me, let me, uh, oh yeah. Hold on here. Stand by here. <laughs> Give me another minute. Uh, 
It's Tatler and Waldorf. That's the uh, the Muppets guys, the old guys at the, on the Muppet show. Those are the names of two hotels, right? The Waldorf and the Statler. Right, right. And I love those guys. Uh, they, they're great in that Christmas Carol movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so hold on here. I have it open here. Where are you, big guy? There we are. Okay, let's do this, buddy. Peace! Live from Toronto, it's Hebsey on Sports, episode number 271. They're coming to Western New York, you know, this summer. Los Lobos with the uh, the Tedeschi Trucks Band. Woo. Oh, live music. Oh, I can hardly wait. Hi, sports fans. Mark Hebsher here in the parking lot of SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles, ready for Super Bowl 56. No, I'm just kidding. I'm in the little Italy studio. Although, don't you wish you were like, like TSN's got the crew out there because they got the right, CTV's got the rights to the Super Bowl, and they're out in the parking lot, and it's 100 fucking degrees, and they're all sitting out there. I think, what's her name's wearing leather pants, Kara Waglin. Anyway, I always thought that was weird. Like, you're, and they're in the background of SoFi Stadium. What's the difference where you are? You could be on a mountaintop in Malibu with a nice place, air-conditioned, out on a deck, and have that shot. Instead, you got to be sitting in a parking lot in Southern California. Anyway, I digress. I wish I was in the parking lot at SoFi Stadium. What am I talking about? Uh, my man, Toronto Mike, the soon-to-be podcast legend, manning the mothership in New Toronto. Go give us a Pope wave there. Go on. And I'm really looking forward to today's podcast as we get into the scariest team in the NBA. Anybody that's not a fan of the Toronto Raptors is scared shitless of this team. They won eight in a row. A month ago, I'm going, man, you know, they're going to win eight in a row. They got beat by Phoenix in the last couple of seconds. Mike, I, mean, I remember you going, oh, you said they were going to win eight in a row. They only won six in a row. And I said, well, no, no, they're going to come back. You watch this team is unbelievable. Eight straight for the Raptors. We'll get into that. The Leafs, awful in Alberta last night as the Flames snapped their six-game winning streak. We'll talk about the Olympics, which are going on now. But, but, the, but in five minutes, things are going to change. And let me know when we start to hear the national anthem, okay, a few times. I want to hear, oh, Canada, before I get into this. We got one gold. One in mixed curling or I, whatever, I don't know, mixed don't biathlon. Know. I don't want Mike, Mike, please. No Olympic updates. Not yet. Wait till we're winning medals, real medals, wow. with real sports, with yeah, sports 13. that I care about. Okay. Skeleton, luge, bobsleigh. We got the Super Bowl and Super Bowl parties. We got the Super Bowl prop bets. We've got a conversation coming up with Lisa Bose, former TSN and CTV journalist, journalista. And author of the popular Lucy Tries Sports uh, children's books series. Children's book series. Mike, you got a few of those, eh? Yeah, my kids enjoy uh, Lucy Tries Hockey. It's great. Lucy! <laughs> you got some uh, explaining to do, Lucy. <laughs> explaining to do. And we'll ask Lisa what it's like working in the TSN newsroom with all those guys and all that testosterone back in the day when she for sure was the only woman. Like, you know, I'm sure behind the scenes there were for some, I know for a fact there were, um, but but in front of the camera, you know, I think you're allowed two, maybe three. Teresa Hergert? Was it Teresa Hergert? Yeah, yeah, Teresa, yeah, Teresa was there around that same time. But I mean, you were allowed two or three, maybe, women, and maybe two blacks, one black, and two Jews. No, one Jew. That's what you were allowed in TSN back in the day. We know that. Mike, we've discussed it on the show before. Oh, look at the look on Mike's face. Well, only folks, because folks, if I don't you were watching, oh, Mike, Mike's yeah. going to say something that's going to cause a no, floor. No, no, no. You He's were very clear. With this that is... stuff again. He's going to bring up the Lou Marsh was a racist stuff again. <laughs> no, the anti Semitic stuff. Here he goes again. Go nuts. Go nuts. The gentleman from Participation, remind me of his name. Hal. Right. Hal came out and said, yeah, he couldn't get hired because he would. they already had a black person. And then you told your story that Michael Landsberg was the well, person of a Jewish uh, faith who I was already employed. He, I believe he, uh, the story was told that uh, we can't hire. We'd love to hire you, Mark, but you know, we got Michael Landsberg. Which is terrible. Yeah. You know, it's awful. Well, that's the 80s, maybe early 90s. But anyway, uh, so we'll get into all that. Super Bowl Sunday coming up. Mike, what are your plans for Super Bowl Sunday? Because it's it's taken over Grey Cup Sunday hmm. uh, for the last number of years, I think, as far as partying goes. And, and now this looks like it may be the one great party coming out of, not coming out of the pandemic, but in a place where a lot of people aren't that concerned as much about getting together with others in a closed setting to watch a, an on. event. We're moving on, my friend. I got to say, I never get invited to Grey Cup parties or Super Bowl parties. I'll be sitting on my couch on Sunday watching the game uh, with maybe maybe Monica will join me. Maybe one of the kids will join me. I don't know. We'll find out. 
Oh, really? What do you got going on? You got I'm disappointed, party? but I'm disappointed. I'm sorry to hear that. I thought you could have like chili and and uh, nice. chicken wings and uh, pizza. Well, who garlic knows what bread we'll get to eat? We'll get something nice to eat. Get I'm Monica. Sure. You know what? Get Monica. Get, you know, get one of those big. Uh, Palma pasta is a good idea, but get one of those big. Um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, breads. Those. What do you? The football shaped the uh, breads. Pumpernickel. Mm. I love bread. And hollow it out. Football in, in, in you know like a football shape. Right. Hollow it out when put in that uh, that uh, dip, that spinach dip inside of it, right? And then sounds good. Oh, that's fantastic. What's your plan for? Uh, I'm going over to my brother's place. We're going to have a Super Bowl party over there. I believe there are going to be six of us, perhaps eight. Uh, and um, uh, we're going to have all. We haven't decided on the menu yet because I don't think like, I have to wait till Super Bowl Sunday to determine what I want to eat. If you're telling me on Friday that I'm having pizza and wings, I don't know. Really? I mean, I, so, I may uh, not feel thing. I may not feel like pizza and wings at six o'clock or five o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. You have days you don't feel like pizza or wings. I've never sure. had such a day. Well, OK, that's the way it is. <laughs> anyway, so I don't know what we're going to have. I don't know. We might have I don't know. We may have sushi. We may have uh, I was thinking a Peking duck anyway. Because of Beijing. Uh, are you excited about the halftime show? I'm, I'm excited, somewhat excited. I have to get some prop bets down on that. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. I'm more excited about the national anthem. I just think okay. it's because because you've got to play it anyway. So why not have a bet on the national anthem? Right. Um, and I'm going to reveal my picks on Sunday. My, you know, my Super Bowl pick um, uh, when I make my Super Bowl video for Bodog, which has got to be like, it's going to be my best video of the year. It's got to be. Uh, speaking of which, how'd you like to win a free limited edition Hebsey on sports t-shirt? I have so many people asking for the t-shirt. They're not, they don't care about the betting. They just want the t-shirt. I'm, I'm not for sale yet. But all you have to do is open a Bodog account, deposit a minimum of $25, up to $200. Bodog will match that amount, and you win a free T-shirt. Hebsy.online slash Bodog. And then you make a play. Hebsy.online slash Bodog. So you put in 50 bucks. Bodog matches the 50. You got $100 to bet on. And you get a free Hebsy T-shirt. Right? You got to prove to us, though, that you... Uh, you know, that you got involved, right? You know, you well, that's be, a question some have been asking, which yeah, is like, when you do this, proof. there's nothing that talks about T-shirt, but we're covering that on the back end. Like, we're tracking who it is and making sure so, these people get their T-shirt. Listen, Bodog's got nothing to do with the T-shirt. That's us. That's coming out of right. my pocket, okay? We're going to come oh. up with t because everybody's got T-shirts. My son's making a fortune on T-shirts, on merch. And you're losing money on T-shirts. I'm losing money. It's okay, though. It's okay, because <laughs> I need, because uh, I want you to bet with me on Bodog. So I get to Wait, wet can my I, whistle. I'm kind of, I'm asked, so if I, if I go to Hebsy dot online slash bodog and i sign up and i can put 200 dollars of my own money in this account and then bodog will say here's 200 more that's right like so, so i'll have 400 dollars. you'll have 400 in your account and a t-shirt and a t-shirt and you could bet 200 of it right off the bat and if you lose the 200 it's, that's not even your money like, that you lost yeah that i was do their money that was bodog it sounds money that too good to be you. true well there you go I'm so going to get my kids favor. into this. This is amazing. There you go. Do you, and it's a minimum $25. That's a minimum. And instead of having to go through a paywall or having me huck you every two minutes for a donation, every five minutes. Remember when you used to watch uh, PBS? You'd be right into this <laughs> event or Monty Python uh, and then Goldie, Goldie and would come yeah. on with what's his name. And Goldie, they'd go on forever yeah. and they never, you'd never know if they were going to be on for 10 minutes. Do you have a t-shirt there, by the way? Somebody wanted to see a sample. Do you got one? No, and here's why. This is the oh. thing. It's being made up as we speak. We, we, what we have is we have some type of algorithm going where we monitor the clothes that you wear, the listener, the viewer. And then we come up with a, a prototype which I'll wear next week on the show. We're going to have one made up. I'll wear it next week. Okay. Just give you an idea. Okay. Maybe That's you like it. Idea. Maybe you hate it. If you hate it, you'll <laughs> tell us. And we only had one made. And then nowadays, of course, you can get them knocked off like that. Limited Is edition. my face on this t-shirt. I just want to know, because I don't remember licensing the use of my image uh, for this uh, t-shirt. Talk to my lawyer. <laughs> All right, listen. So you don't want me hocking you every couple of minutes. You don't want to go through a paywall like you're going to have to do with Wordle. And plus, if you think you're a better sports handicapper than me, go, go, let's go. I'm very good. You get a T-shirt, you double your money, you help an independent journalist who wants you to know the truth, who isn't afraid to call people out. Uh, and you're contributing to the health, welfare, and happiness of me, my family, Mike, his family, all of our friends. So it's about being a humanitarian. It's about being a good citizen. Hebsy.online slash Bodog. Thank you. Super Bowl's coming Sunday. It just so happens, Mike, and I'm not rubbing this in, to you, although you were the one who were skeptical from the beginning. And I think that's what made me love the Raptors even more. 
because I thought, you know, here's Mike kind of jumping off the bandwagon, looking to towards 2025 and a championship season with, you know, third year Scotty Barnes and, you know, veterans Pascal Siakam and OG. And I get that. But to me, it was sort of you were like thumbing your nose at the Raptors. And so last night, it just so happened that these Raptors who, uh, you know, could have been going for the number one draft pick if they had listened to Mike. <laughs> they were seven point favorites in Houston on a seven game winning streak against the Rockets. So against the Rockets, a seven game winning streak, comma, against the Rockets last night. Why were they seven point favorites, Mike? Because as I've been telling you all along, they're just as good as Brooklyn, Boston, Cleveland, better. And as good as Philadelphia and Chicago and Milwaukee and Miami, nobody wants to play the Raptors. They put up 139 last night, a buck 39 without Fred Van Vliet. What if Van Vliet was playing and he knocked in 50? Can you imagine the Raptors putting up 200 points? No. Right, I'm, I'm getting I don't think little, it works that way. I'm getting a little beyond <laughs> myself. Anyway, they beat Houston by 19 points. They covered the spread and made yours truly very happy because I had a bet going with Bodoc with the money that I got. Not, it's not under my name. It could be under my name, I guess, but I'm under a pseudonym. But it doesn't matter. I had to produce a credit card. Anyway, they covered. They covered. 225 was the total. The over-under total was 225. Okay? They scored 259 points between them, easily covering that as well. Gary Trent, junior. Although I'm not going to call the junior anymore. It's Gary Trent. His old man is done. He doesn't play anymore. Okay? I don't think a grown man should be called junior. That's just my... Opinion. Wow, wow. That's ever, since, ever since Ken Griffey Jr., whose nickname was Junior, and every other guy who was nicknamed Junior, I feel bad for people like that. I feel bad that you're always going to be... You feel bad for junior. Donald Trump Jr.? Junior! Everyone named Junior, okay? Gary Trent had 42 points last night. 42! Pascal Siakam, 30. The Raptors shot 55%. The bench was awesome. The coaching is fantastic. Raptors are breathing fire down Philly's neck in fifth place. They're four games back. A first place, Miami. Four back. You know why the Sixers and Nets made the blockbuster Harden-Simmons deal? Because they're both worried about the Raptors. They have to prepare themselves to play against the Raptors. They have to have a team when the playoffs come that could beat the Raptors because the Raptors are, are scaring everybody. A few episodes ago, back in January, the Raptors had, a, I believe it was a five-game winning streak or four-game winning streak going. And I said, Mike, next week at this time, when we come back a week later on the Fridays for the podcast, I said, Mike, this team's going to have an eight game winning streak when we come back. And when we came back the following week, they didn't. They, their streak was stopped at six by Phoenix uh, in the last few seconds, if I recall. And then, and then they went on another run and they're 17 and six since December the 31st, a six game winning streak. And now an eight game, four out of first place, two games in hand on Miami. Oh, have you don't even say it. Don't even think about it, Hebsey. First place overall in this division, im fucking possible. Not impossible. Never say impossible. Be very afraid. Nick Nurse is an NBA champion coach. NBA champion coach. That's uh, how correct. Many, how many others out there? Go ahead and name all the coaches in the East that have won the NBA championship. I'll wait. <laughs> Eric Spolster. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. Listen. No, no. But seriously. Okay. This yeah. team is. Unbelievable. Van Vliet's a champion. Nurse a champion. Ananobi's a champion. Siakam's a champion. Chris Boucher's a champion. Scotty Barnes is a future champion. And Precious and Trent and Birch and Banton. I love this team. Next up, Saturday at home against the Denver Nuggets. 500 lucky fans will get to watch the game. Enough already, Mr. Ford. Enough. Let's expand the capacity to a reasonable number. We deserve it. Okay? We, we've looked after ourselves. Everybody's got to be fully vaxxed anyway to get in there. Look at, look at Calgary last night. Look at these other jurisdictions. Come on. Enough's enough. T two quick notes. One is uh, Gary Trent Jr. can decide what his name is. If he wants to be a junior, he can be a junior. You know, he's... I'm calling him Gary Trent. If he's <laughs> offended by me calling him Gary Trent, too bad. Oh, well, okay. So that's how it goes. Okay, the second that's thing. That's how it goes. You know, that's you, his name. You get to decide your own name, usually, typically. If you I yelled out, me if, Toronto Mike because hey, I said so. If I went to the Blue Jays spring training, which I'm going to if they ever play baseball, and right. I haven't even, th I'm not even a thought about baseball. We're going anyway. And I see Vladimir Guerrero Jr., Lourdes Goriel Jr., mm -hmm. and I go, Junior, and eight guys turn around. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> Junior well, Felix turns around. 
Junior Felix turns around, right. Every guy named Junior, okay? <laughs> yeah. Okay. The second point, though, I just want to, for the record, because you like all to right. drag me of the Raptor talk all the time. I do. That, I do like I, it. Man. I know. I, I know. Do, I I, I, because I, you I, stuck I, your foot in your mouth by going, yeah, I think that you I 100%. Because as soon as you jumped off the bandwagon when they looked like shit no, earlier this year. And I they did look that. and they did look like shit. They did. They looked I like said shit. to you the truth, which is I was okay with this team getting another lottery pick because I was looking long term and I didn't think it was a championship team. But that doesn't mean I ever rooted against my Raptors. This I never Raptors. said you did. I never there. said you did. I love but this one, team. But once you, even if you don't use the T word, tanking, even if you don't use it, right. just the thought, just the, 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 the thought of you wanting <laughs> yeah. the team to be okay a, with that, being a, okay with Being that. okay with them losing. Because the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is right. the draft right. pick. I don't right. like that way of thinking. It's negative thing, negative waves, man. And you're not a negative person normally. You're very positive. That's true. But when I get those negative waves, realist. those negative sports fan waves, oh, the Leafs are up three goals in the third. Like right. that? Don't want to hear it. Uh, by the way, NBA trade deadline day was nuts. Uh, check NBA.com for all the moves. I, I'm not, I mean, I love basketball, but I'll be here forever, you know. Uh, and they don't, their trade deadline desks aren't like in hockey where, you know, they got, although it's not bad. I kind of like Charles Barkley. I like those guys, but it's not the same. Although trade deadline day in the NBA has become like nuts. This, this, <laughs> this Harden Simmons deal. And by the way, I didn't hear anyone mention it. As soon as I heard Harden Simmons, I thought Harden Simmons, that's a university in Abilene, Texas, by the way, Harden Simmons university. But is that true? Or is that a joke? No, it is. Wow. And it has been, I didn't and it that. has been, yeah, for a long time. Okay, it's a quite quite fairly well known school for those of us that know anything about college sports. Okay, but anyway, I thought Harden Simmons deal what, and that was like Ben Simmons, okay, yeah. Seth Curry, Andre Drummond, and two first round picks to Brooklyn for uh, James Harden and Paul Millsap. And James Harden next year will earn forty seven point three million dollars. Next year, forty seven point three million. Right. Boy, did the Brooklyn Nets ever fall apart quickly? Hey, Steve Nash. He was going to be the coach of the year, and now they've lost 10 in a row. What the hell went wrong? The Toronto Maple Leafs, who came into southern Alberta on a six-game winning streak, laid an egg last night. Oh, yeah, a dinosaur egg, man, like a brontosaurus egg. No, that was a brontosaurus rib. Anyway, uh, last night in Calgary, even though early on, I thought the game was being played at the Scotiabank Arena. I see all these. I go, oh, beautiful. Ford lifted the restrictions. <laughs> uh, wh why wasn't I made aware of this? The hell? It's Leafs. It's all the Leaf fans. Way louder than the Calgary fans, who are at the best of times, are about this loud. Go, go, Flames, go. Go, go. <laughs> Quietest rink I've been in was Calgary. Quietest fucking rink. Wow. This was two years ago. I found out one of the reasons was that they had displaced all these season's ticket holders. This is when they were doing renovations to the Saddle Dome. Mm -hmm. So they had taken like thousands of season ticket holders who all sat amongst each other. And as you know, there's strength in numbers, Mike. When you're cheering, when you're booing, whatever it is, right. you know, you got the support of everybody around you, right? In Toronto, it's not like that because the season ticket is all corporations and it's different people sitting in the seats for the most part. But there was this group of fans and they were great. And then what happened was they, some of them had to be displaced because they were doing renovations and they scattered them around the building and people started dropping off, uh, forgetting about their season ticket subscriptions. They didn't like the fact that they were sitting amongst strangers or they weren't with their friends or whatever. So it's very important. So when all these Leaf fans all get together and they're all wearing the blue or the white, for the most part, blue Leaf shirts, and they're all clustered together. I'm thinking this game's in Toronto. No, it's in Calgary. And uh, you would think that maybe hearing more noise for the visiting team than the home team, the, the you know maybe the Flames might uh, you know take offense to that. And they did. Even though they were outshot 47 to 26, they pounded the Leafs five to two with a blitz of goals, like three goals in less than three minutes. And suddenly Jack Campbell, I don't know doesn't look like uh you know the number one goalie fabulous goalie how could he keep up those numbers anyway i mean come on you can't keep that up calgary's a good team they're in a dogfight for the playoffs in the west i mean that's a battle and the leafs are not under any pressure at this point to win mike you know what i mean totally no absolutely. they won six in a row nice they came up against a good team a hungry team okay Remember, my other take on the Leafs, which you, you argued me on, was that uh, I don't really give a rat's ass about anything Maple Leafs. I'll tune in now and then if it's convenient for me. But until uh, playoff time, like I've seen this movie before. Right, I right. I, yeah, I know. But I mean, but it's the it's about the journey, though, right, Mike? Like if you kind of just tune out the Leafs and then turn in 
tune in only during the playoffs, you don't have the same perspective. You know, if they play well, you know, you, you weren't, the, you weren't there saying, yeah, you know, back in mid-March, I was watching them carefully and I noticed that Marner is starting. And so part of the journey is, and any fan will tell you this, and I tell anyone that I've ever been with before, friend, family, wife, ex-wife, <laughs> once you leave the room, like once you say, I can't watch this anymore, okay? And you leave the room when the team or whoever you're rooting for starts to fail, and that's jumping off the bandwagon. You can't, you got to hang in there, man, if you're a real fan. You can't just be a fair weather fan saying, oh, I like them when they were winning, but now that they're playing shitty, I can't watch it. You can and, tune and, out. You can you tune leave. out when they're not, when they're shitty. Like it's all about entertainment value. Not right? all the time. They, you know, come on, man. You got to hang in there. You got the ups and the downs. Or what? Like sometimes you can come fade on. out because they're shit and then you can come back when they start to put it together. That's all good. It's all good. At the, all that matters is that when the playoffs come and the Leafs bow out in the first round, round there's a lot of angry Leafs fans, uh, you know, pounding in their table so get ready i get it but can you not enjoy the success they're having during the regular season is that or is that enjoyment I, I is can. that enjoyment tempered for you it's gone like you had gone earth. completely like it's here's like what dull? happened here's what happened remember we scorched the earth right get rid of kessel Fanuf, whatever we scorched the earth we start having these high draft picks like you know marner and matthews etc we bring in some bodies this team looks really strong really good we start to have a great regular season i'm excited but after multiple first round failures by this team and one of them was actually that play in with columbus which wasn't even the first round if you want to get technical multiple times getting burned i've learned basically not to get excited about regular season success with this team that's a fact i think a lot of leafs fans feel that wow so you've been completely desensitized so if the leafs score sure. a big goal if austin matthews scores an awesome goal you're like mm, do like, that in the they do it in the first is that right round. Yeah, is that yeah. what you're saying dude of course uh, we pat wow. quinn was our coach pat quinn was our coach the last time we won a, a round in the playoffs pat quinn was our coach how long wow. has he been dead jeez wow didn't know I, I don't wish up. we ill on the I, man. I love the guy, but he passed away a long time ago, and he was our coach last time we won a playoff round. I I wasn't aware that you were you know this bitter. Oh yeah, okay. no, come on, come on. This is a tough team to love. I was born into this team like you were, and uh, it's a bit of a curse because uh, we haven't won a playoff round since two thousand and four. Okay, my twenty year old, <laughs> he was still I think still crap and <laughs> still pee in bed at night i don't want to out him but i'm pretty sure he was still wetting the bed when we last uh won a playoff round you realize that even if the maple leafs were to get to the stanley and they haven't been to a stanley cup final never mind the i mean the best they've done is the final four uh twice i think right since well, 1967 four times four, four times since twice with, yeah like, twice with pat twice burns, with pat burns, burns and twice with pat quinn okay <laughs> yeah yeah but that's it other oh than my the, god uh, all right game seven against the kings we all know uh, what happened that day that's the closest uh, we've got and that was 93 so okay so playoffs is what matters for this toronto maple leafs teams and i think 99 percent of leafs fans would agree with me like let's see what happens in the playoffs well listen they're comfortably in third place in the atlantic division Okay, they got Tampa and they've got Florida ahead of them. They got games in hand. They're in no hurry and right. It'd be lovely to win the division. Doesn't look like they will. You don't know. Mm -hmm. um, is it important to win the division? It would be better to have a home ice advantage by then. We lost to the Habs last year. Okay, I know. Think Look, think about that. I know when they fired their coach, um, which we'll get into in a second. Uh, first of all, I want to mention. Uh, so the Leafs comfortably in third. Didn't have to win last night. They won six in a row before that. Not a lot of folks were like, yeah, leave six in a row, let's go, baby, all the way to the Stanley Cup final. We, you're right, Mike. We've heard this song before. Um, Saturday, the Leafs are in Vancouver for a tilt with the Canucks, who now have three females in their front office, high up in the front office, including Cami Granado, uh, who was just named as assistant general manager to go along with uh, Emily uh, uh, Castilgate, who is the other, I believe, a, a play player personnel or assistant. Anyway, you got three women, women now uh, uh, high up in the Canucks organization. And uh, Bruce Boudreaux, of course, uh, was uh, hired as coach a while back and has done pretty well. And uh, uh, this is one of the things that the media pundits and especially my friends, Tony Kornheiser and Mike Wilbon at PTI love to pick on when they love hockey, but they love to pick on hockey for one thing and one thing only. And that is how quickly they fire coaches. Because it's true. No other sport is like this. Basketball is not like this. In hockey, man, once the fans get on you, once it's like, let's go. Like Dave Tippett should have been fired a long time ago, right? For everyone's sanity. But no, no, no. We'll hang in. We'll do it. And then once they reach the point, it was like, ah, okay, we got, we traded for this guy. We got, we got Evander Kane. We got, it doesn't matter. We got, we got Zach Hyman. We got, 
We don't have goaltending. The fans are all over us. There's nothing else to do in Winnipeg, in uh, Edmonton, I mean, right? Nothing. Eskimos or Elks, oops, sorry, are done. Elks. I don't know what else goes on there. They go elk hunting in Edmonton. But the oh, only sports yes. they have are the Oilers. That's it. Here we got the Raptors and we got this. And, you know, we got all this other stuff in Toronto. We're in a big city. Right. But Edmonton is in the, you know, it's. Look, I've been to Edmonton, okay? That's I have little, too. That's not the too. capital of the universe, okay? I have, I have too, okay? It's, it's yeah. It's, uh, anyway, so that's what they got to do in Edmonton. So we all knew Dave Tippett was walking the tightrope. Should have been fired a long time ago. He's out now, replaced by Jay Woodcroft, who was coaching in Bakersfield with the Condors before he got the call. Dave Charlie Manson's going to be his assistant. The over-under on how long this duo lasts behind the bench? 52 games is the over. 52. Is the, I just made that up. It's not a, <laughs> okay. not a, it's not a bow dog line, but that would be a good line. Hey, how many games, how many games does the average coach last in the NHL from the time the coach gets the job? How many games would be the average tenure? I'd like to know average. What tenure. would be your guess on that? That's a great With a team. Well, With a I team. feel like it's average. I feel like it's, yeah, I'd say on this average. This guy's been there. Like this guy's been there. 10 200 years. games, 200 games on average, 200 games, man. That you, that's a lot. Average. Maybe. I mean, I that's average. I mean, that's just my. Let's, guess. Uh, you know what? Somebody look up. I want to see how many games did Bruce Boudreaux play with uh, coach this team before he got canned, then that team before he got canned. How many games did Pat Quinn coach the Kings, the Canucks, the Leafs? A lot. I know that. But I mean, how many? Uh, Pat Burns. How many games did Pat Burns coach with the Leafs, the Bruins, the Devils, the Habs? How many? Right. What's the average? Uh, that's, and that's top end. How many let's guys get, get somebody on this? Is VP of sales listening? Let's get some numbers crunched. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Yeah. You know what? Uh, yeah. So these media pundits, though, they just love it. They think it's wild. And the other day they were having a field day. Boom. Dominic Ducharme took the Stanley, went to the Stanley Cup final with the Montreal Canadiens. What have you done for me lately? Gone. Replaced by Marty St. Louis. Okay. Who was coaching Pee Wee last <laughs> week and made a joke about it. I'm sure the Habs players are like, who? Marty St. Louis, like, who was he coaching? Was he coaching our farm team? No. College team? No. High school team? No. What? Pee Wee. What? What does he know about line changes? And in his first game, first of all, before he even coaches his first game at home against Washington, who didn't have Ovechkin because he couldn't get into Quebec because he got recently had COVID. Um, his first game, before his first game, he's like, we're going to have fun. I mean, dude, man, you just took over a team that's fragile. And you're going to walk in and go, hello, guys. Look, going to have some fun. Everybody gets ice cream after the game. Are you kidding me? Like, where's your credibility? Now, okay, it's a stopgap measure. We'll see how he does. We're out of it this year. We'll see. In the meantime, we'll keep an eye open, see who else gets fired. Maybe we'll recycle an old coach. But come on. Marty St. Louis. Yikes. But he's fun. French. He speaks French. Let's have fun. Come on, you guys. Let's have fun. <laughs> all right yeah. um we're gonna get to super bowl sunday coming up uh we'll talk about that but uh what i want to do first is i want to talk to you about personal hygiene not okay. you specifically mike because i know that you know you and i are both using uh nate so for the record nate's i got soap. myself some of nate's soap and i think make soap it. and my uh my First of all, my, my backpack, when I got it, when I got home, my backpack smelled wonderful. And then now my bathroom smells wonderful. And you know what else smells wonderful? What? Me! You smell good. Get over here, big guy. I've never smelled so good. Excellent. Uh, so Nate makes soap. So I, I have one here. This is called Lovely Lavender. It's coconut and clay soap. I have Lovely Lavender. What, what have you been using? What's the... Oh, I've got several. Smoky firstly. bourbon? There's some good uh, stuff. Anyway, uh, listen, amazing. listen. We're very big on personal hygiene here on the show. As you can see, it's why our guests receive a lovely gift from NateMakesSoap.com. Most soaps dry out your skin, but this soap moisturizes as it cleans. And Nate is so confident you'll love his soap. He's willing to give you a free sample if you live anywhere between McCowan Road to the east and the 427 to the west and from Steeles to the north all the way down to the lake. That's a big area. Get your free sample at Hebsey.online slash soap that's Hebsey. a new area right that's a new area nate has expanded his delivery area because hey, i just he delivered to long branch evan Dulbegin. i delivered him his soap i delivered am i the guy getting you to the 427 you're gonna have to talk to nate about that okay let me finish the the, the uh the pitch here hebsey <laughs> hebsey dot online slash soap uh, uh for a free sample of nate's uh soap it's awesome support the podcast and support a local small business uh good good what's that What's that? 
The doorbell rang. I think oh. Lisa's at the door. Uh, goodfootdelivery.com. Uh, we've got a, a, a partnership with these uh, fine folks. Goodfootdelivery.com is a Toronto courier service that provides meaningful employment to the neurodiverse and developmentally disabled community. They offer employment and support to a community of people who traditionally have challenges finding regular, meaningful employment. This is a great company to use. Let's say you want something delivered from a local bookstore or a specialty store. Or let's say you want to get a special Valentine's Day gift for your partner or have one delivered to them. Let's say you want flowers delivered. Let's say you want chocolates delivered, whatever. Use goodfootdelivery.com. You can have anything delivered affordably and reliably, uh, as little as $4 for a delivery. And you can get 50% off any of the delivery services. Just go to goodfootdelivery.com and use the promo code HEBSY50 for 50% off your first two deliveries and help support a local charitable organization. Our guest today began working in the sports business, sports television business in 1989 at TSN. TSN stands for The Sports Network, not Toronto Sports Network, The <laughs> Sports Network. And at TSN was originally located on Don Mills Road, uh, right across the train tracks from Global Television. And back then, TSN did not have a cafeteria and Global did have a cafeteria. So TSN employees would either have to go drive to Don Mills Center to the food court there or trudge across the tracks uh, and through the global parking lot and into enemy territory to uh, eat if they wanted to. Lisa Bose, did you ever uh, did you ever venture to the dark side and into the global cafeteria? I actually did not. I did not do that, but I heard many stories about that. And Mike Day, who you would know, who was actually our supervising producer at the time who used to work with you, Oh, yeah. A lot of the guys went who, over who? there. Who's that? <laughs> Mike Day. Oh, yeah. Mike, for sure. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, that's right. He went over to the dark side, Mike. I haven't spoken to him since. He left, <laughs> he left Sportsline to go to TSN. A lot of people, they're very competitive back in those days. I don't think it is as much. Um, when you got to TSN, uh, uh, where were you before that? You were at uh, Ryerson? What was it? I, you and I actually connect back to Conestoga College. <laughs> and they used to tell us when I was in school about guess who one of our graduates is Mark Hebsher and and me and the guys we just we were so excited about that to follow in your footsteps so I actually did a phys ed degree in western in London Ontario and then I graduated out of that degree and wanted to get into into broadcasting and so I went to Conestoga but while I was there I was there for just one year and that's when I started to volunteer at TSN. So I used to drive into Toronto from, from Guelph and Kitchener every weekend and volunteer. And I worked in the tape room. So I did the tech stuff. And then I saw Mark Jones through the glass in the newsroom, who is now, you know, down south at ESPN. And I thought that's where I want to be. So in April of 1989, I became a flugan, Mark. That's what we were called. I know. Flugans, yeah. <laughs> we made fifty dollars a shift. It didn't matter how long the shift was, and then the government <laughs> came and took tax off. <laughs> fifty bucks a shift at TSN in nineteen eighty nine. You bet, you wow. bet. But we By were way, so yeah. happy to be there, right? Having that opportunity, and we were writing for all the commentators and some of the early shows that I was part of. Pat Marsden, it's your call. Pat Marsden. Pat Marsden. <laughs> Sports page. Sports page was something that John Wells did. Uh, Bob McKenzie in his early days there. Bill Waters. Uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So that's some of my early, early days in the sports broadcasting business. And, and I must say, it really did set a foundation for me later on. By the way, they lied to you about Conestoga. I never graduated. <laughs> I, I never did. I barely failed. I barely passed my first year. I failed my second year because I was a disc jockey on two local stations, one in Guelph, Seajoy, where my name was Mark Walker on the air. And the other was in Cambridge, CFTJ. And my name was Mark. Oh, I can't even remember, but I had two, I had two different on air names because you couldn't be called Mark Hebsher. What kind of a name is that? I had to have a disc jockey name. <clears throat> and one night on Seajoy, I called myself whatever the other, the wrong name. And the, the boss there heard about it and, and I got fired. So I never graduated from uh, Conestoga College. So they lied to you. They lied to you there. Um, what There wasn't even like sports television wasn't even a, like TSN had only been around for a few years then. Um, 
had you not gotten into TSN, would would uh, would you have ended up somewhere else in the broadcasting business, or would you have been somewhere in the sports business? I think I still would have. I really wanted to get into sports broadcasting, and at that time, there were many many females on air in sports that I could look to in the United States, but not as many in Canada. Who was in Canada that you, that you followed? So that would have been definitely for, you know, T. Hergert. So Teresa, Teresa Herger, Teresa Cruz, then later Brenda Irving, who is still going strong. I think mm. Brenda is literally calling like her 12th Olympic Games. She does not get the props I believe that she deserves. She is a, a true professional broadcaster. She's been around for so long. And, and so those were some of the, some of the, the females that we had, you know, uh, there were, our, I guess, our colleagues at the time. But I guess I always would have, I mean, I tried, while I was at Conestoga, just quickly, a quick story about where I actually started. My very first on-air job was at uh, CKLA in Guelph. And I had an opportunity to be hosting one hour show and it was organ music. <laughs> it was called Keyboard and Console. And it was, you know, Richard Claterman playing this rendition of Billie Jean. I mean, it was really early days. And so I think I always wanted to do that broadcasting piece because I love to write and I grew up with boys. Uh, I was really influenced by Wide World of Sports. Who can forget a certain a certain era of us will remember Jim McKay and you know the what the thrill of victory the yeah. agony of defeat dun, I'm sure da, yeah. dun, 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 da, dun, dun, dun. that is some of the most famous music right like whoever came up with the score for that dun, dun, dun. and and of course as we both know I mean there's something beautiful about editing a piece with music and the timing of the, the crashing of the symbol as the guy hits the deck. I mean, that's also beautiful, but yeah. So we're talking about, so you grew up where? So I grew up in Guelph, Ontario. All right. Brothers, sisters, how many? I, I have a brother. Yeah. I have a brother. And so my street was full of boys. And so whenever people ask me about how did you get into sports? I really think that I was socialized through sport with the boys because, you know, I was playing caps uh, you know, we're going to the park playing ball. We were at the at the local ice rink, you know, lights come on, come on in, you know, and gosh, you know, I think I even have my marble collection. <laughs> I really I think I do. I think I've in a box somewhere in a jewelry box. Like how how tomboyish is that? I've got my marble collection in a jewelry box. <laughs> so I think that that's uh, that's really, I guess, formed my perception of myself, really, in many ways, being socialized with boys and in sport. And that's why I went into phys ed in the first place. I wanted to get into sports psychology, actually. But then when I was at school at Western, I played soccer. And while I was there, I, I got involved in student radio. And then that was it. I, I wanted to get to Conestoga. Seemed like a great program. But I, like you, I didn't graduate. But I had that incredible experience. 50 bucks a shift as a flugan. And many of those guys that I sat with on the row. So I was the first female in that world, in that newsroom to do that job. And we'll explain, all be at you explain, explain what that job was, because when I was at Global, I mean, we had our our team of guys. Um, and there were a couple of girls, I guess, um, that that put the show together like uh, every night at 1130. But at, at TSN, you had multiple shows to do. So so what was your shift like? You come in there and they went, all right, Bose, get there and record that game. Like, what was it like? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I love to answer this. It's, it's really, you come in and then you're assigned a series of games. So you can imagine on a weekend, there are so many, it's a full slate. And so what happens is at that time, we were sitting in front of typewriters. It's true typewriters and we were banging out the highlight script so sometimes i'd be watching two or three games at a time and then i'd be crafting the highlight packages for the commentators to read and many times i can remember one time in fact i think i kept a lineup mark i kept the lineup because i think i was responsible for six highlight packs wow so i'd watch a couple games and then they'd fly out of that if it was a blowout okay, let's fly out of that and bring in this other game from the West Coast. So we were literally doing two or three ball games and, a, you know, an amateur sport game and bringing in a reporter's uh, a story at the same time. So it was just go, 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 go. But wow, what an experience. I, and, and, you know, and the prompter at the time, we would have paper and you would have had this at Sportsline, the yep. paper feed. So the prompter, we had to tape the paper for the commentators and most of them, and it would get stuck. Yeah. So many times. 
Oh, you're I remember really, it happening to me on the air where you're reading and all of a sudden the, 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 the script isn't moving because and you hear crinkly, the crinkling of the paper, right? <laughs> and, and the telecue operator, the auto queue or whatever you call it, I mean, there are many types, would look over at you because they were sitting right near us, would look over at you like this. And you'd be going like, what's going on? And then you'd have to find your script. The first thing they tell you, Taddy, the first thing Taddy showed me was when you finish with your page of script, turn it upside down and down so that if you lose, you know where you are. But, but a lot of anchors would just sit there and read it off the uh, prompter and never flip the pages. So when the prompter went down, they had no idea where they are in their live script, right? And, and at the time, we didn't wear earpieces either. You're on your own. The studio director's going, uh, page 27. And you're live and going, okay, well, hi. It was the, oh, that's the wildest, uh, wildest thing. It really is. It's amazing uh, how we put it all together, but that's really what a flugin was. The better name for it is an editorial assistant. Yeah, yeah. And then you the move end. up to story editor and yeah. then associate producer and then producer. Is that so what happened I, with you? And, and well, what happened with me is actually that I then got an opportunity to go down to Maple Leaf Gardens and do some of the leaf skates in the mornings on the Saturday before my shift. That's how hungry I was. I wanted to become a reporter. And so I, I would go down, get the clips, we'd shoot the morning skate, come back, put a little VO clip, it's called, together, and then Gino or John or, or Romy or Jim Van Horn would voice it. And so that gave me that field experience. Right, and which is very important, what, yeah. Very important, and so that's what led to me to audition for a number of positions across the West. And that's how I ended up at CTV in Winnipeg. CKY, the mighty CKY. Mm. Yeah, Polo Park, right? Voted to the end. I was hired to replace Rod Black in Winnipeg. But most people might think, oh, well, that must have been easy. You know, as a woman, you, I did not want to be, I, I want to make this clear. I did not want to be that token female. I wanted to get that job and do it on my, you know, on, on real merit. Uh, but I do believe it was an advantage because I was a visual change to Rod, who had a very strong following and had been there for many years. But my audition was actually covering a Hawks Jets game. And I had to prove that I could do that job. And then I was hired. So that experience that you had going to Maple Leaf Gardens, talking to the players, looking them in the eye, helping put a story together and all that really served you well uh, when you went to Winnipeg. I can't imagine what it would be like to try to replace Rod Black in, in Winnipeg. I remember when I was there, the guy like, was a legend. Like Rod Black, Don Whitman, I mean, um, uh, Bob Irving doing Winnipeg uh, Blue Bomber games. I mean, you know, legendary uh, uh, characters in, in there. I want to ask you something. I want to uh, phrase this so that it's not uncomfortable. But did you feel that you had to be even better, like uh, above what you what a, a guy had to know? You had to know more than what a guy had to know in order to um, to not be looked at as a skirt. I'm thinking about when I was working at Global in the '80s and early '90s, where I was like, "All right, what does she know? Let's put her to the test." Did Did you get the the feeling that eyes were on you for a certain way, and that you really had to know more than the average guy? I, uh, I think the eyes were absolutely magnified for sure. I was in a magnifying um, I, a fishbowl, I guess is really, I think all of us felt that at that time, because I mean, really women were really not in this space in mid seventies, I'd say, and very few. But when I started, there were a lot of beat reporters, Cynthia Lambert, the great writer from the Detroit Red Wings. I remember mm -hmm. her quite clearly and a lot of scribes, but not as many TV. And so so there was that aspect of we were really noticed because we were the TV. We've got the camera with us. We're so, we're, you know, people are really aware of us being there. And I definitely felt that. And I think my colleagues at the time would say the same thing. I think we we wanted so much to be accepted that you really had to make sure that you didn't make one mistake. It was really more. I think that's how I would craft it, Mark, is more making sure you didn't make a mistake. And absolutely making sure you had answers when people would ask you questions. I'm not the best person at, at remembering statistics, but I worked really, really hard, though, to prove to not just my colleagues, but all of the athletes and the coaches that I was there to do a job and I was credible right. and that I was working hard to make sure that I really understood the team and was ready to report on them and make sure that I, I had the story correct to have it factual. But for sure, there was always that pressure to be accepted. That's really what it was, yeah. to be accepted in that space. 
Yep. And you know, you're accepted when someone's got your back, when it doesn't even have to be a, someone you work at the same station with, but someone who's on the beat with you, for example. And I remember when I was covering Leafs playoffs one year, I think in St. Louis, and, and I, um, I had a bite to eat with Teresa Hergert, uh, was her name at the time, um, uh, Teresa Cruz later, and, and her cameraman, I think was Rob Mulligan at the time. But anyway, what happened was we were discussing the exact same thing, and she wanted to make sure that she had everything absolutely 100% correct in her story before she sent it back to TSN. And I, I recognize that. That, that had she made one little mistake that they'd be all over her, they may not be all over a guy who made the same kind of mistake. In fact, yes. they wouldn't. Exactly. And so, that's yeah, really yeah. what we were hoping. That's really what right. you hope for. And the last, I'll just tell, just to close this off is that one of the best things I ever, ever heard early in my career, or maybe midway was one of the players came up to me and said, you know, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but I actually, you really do a good job. I actually forgot you were a female. <laughs> oh, so you're just a reporter, which is really what exactly. You want. Now, some people might think, "Ooh, that's brutal," but no. To me, at that time, that's everything. That is everything at that time in my experience. Right. That and was this, everything. And they the, saw and me as a reporter. Who was the who was the player? It was uh, the kicker for the Sam Peters. It was uh, Martino, Tony Martino. Tony Martino, nice. Yeah, went into insurance, but still, <laughs> but took the time to come over, even though. The phraseology, um, what might not have been right, the spirit that, that was intended uh, was the message there. That's terrific to hear that. That's great. I like that. That's a good story. So let's go. Let's. I want to go back to when you started at TSN. G give me, so imagine you're there on a date. So all these big names, like I'm thinking from 1989. Like so, you mentioned Pat Mars. You mentioned John Wells. Who else can you think of that that we would know? that you worked with that would have had an influence on you. And, and in fact, who, when you worked there, did have the greatest influence on you? That would be Peter Watts, without a question, without a doubt in mind. And, and Wattsy, as he was called, although I, I called him PW, and we sadly lost him a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, and, and we're very happy we've set up a, a, a legacy fund through U Sports in his honor. And so a student can get a, a grant uh, for if they're falling into journalism or media studies. But Peter Watts really uh, exemplified to me that real, that old school CBC, but, you know, journalism and accuracy and his Rolodex, Pepsi, his Rolodex was unbelievable. I, mean, I think he could call up Don King. I'm pretty sure that's what Gino told me one time. Yeah. He had Don King in his Rolodex. How, and did, how, do you, how does he get, how did he develop those contacts? Did he tell you? And, you know, he, he was very well guarded and I was just a flugin at the time <laughs> and I was not privy to the to the Rolodex of, of Peter Watts. But I think it was all him building relationships. And he really taught me a lot, too, about how how we treat people as well. And, and Vic Router, Vic Router as well. So I learned the king, Vic, Vic is the, the king. I'm listening yeah. to him the other day, man. Yeah. I, I, he's he's amazing. Eh? Yeah, absolutely. Vic uh, he's a writer. Yeah, he's a and you know, sorry uh, to jump on you there, Mark, but I, I think with Vic, what I learned from him was when I then later got into, uh, you know, hosting live event and doing play by play, I watched how Vic would go and he wouldn't just leave the booth. He would always go into the truck and thank everybody. And and I, I really value that. I really value teamwork. And I think we're all sure that you see those of us in front of the camera but there's so many people behind us. And, and he really taught me that. And Paul Romanek, he taught me about working hard. Um, and, and, you know, he and I are still connected to this day. And I sold so many people. I feel so grateful and blessed. And, and if you notice, they are all men. And I've been always influenced by men. I've had incredible friendships with them and they have helped me in my journey. And I mean, I, I, I feel, I feel like I want to give them all a big hub when, when some of that me too, a lot of, and I've had so many few, few and far between experiences when we talk about Me Too. And I just wanted to give a big hug to all my male colleagues because they really help me and support me. And, and I know we, we all love each other. <laughs> That's great to hear. I think a lot of I think there's a lot of bitterness amongst many women with regards to the fact that there wasn't equality for all these years and women are still fighting for equality. And it's nice to hear a woman say, listen, you know, I'm all for women's rights. And of course, but, but if it wasn't for these men, 
you know, I wouldn't be where I am today. It's nice to hear it's refreshing because I think it's easy for men and women to look at it differently and, and try to make up for uh, lost time and that type of thing. And, and I think a lot of it, you know, even when we see these events, when they say it's an all female broadcast team, I think, but is the entire crew female? In other words, are all the camera operators female? Are the audio, is the audio engineer female? If it's a real all female crew, don't just show me five or six women that are on camera. I want to see all the women that are involved in this. And I think that's an important distinction too, because it's kind of, you know, like you say, tokenism, that to me is kind of like tokenism. Like, Hey, look at all the women that are doing this. Are they doing this on a regular basis? Is the entire crew women? Um, I think that's an important uh, distinction there. Have you worked with crews that are all female crews before? I have not. No, I have not. I have done. Uh, so I have done in the booth. Uh, so Cassie Campbell, Pascal and I, we did some play by play early days. Uh, Kylie Richardson was also my partner, Bev Smith, the incredible mm -hmm. uh, legend in, in basketball. Uh, was with me in the booth, but I have not, I've had actually Dawn Landis who has done. I know Dawn very well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So she's a, a fabulous director. And so her and I have done some games, but I'm pretty sure we did those games on maybe it might've been women's hockey, but she's doing both sides, right? It's, there's no real yeah. difference when you get to that level. The sport there's, is sport. Yeah. You know what? I think you're right. I think that uh, if you were to say that was a terrific production and then you were to say, do you know that it was all women that did that production? Uh, that's wonderful. Uh, I, I, we shouldn't notice a difference at this at that highest level. You shouldn't notice a difference, gender or, or, or anything like that. Was um, did you find that when in the early days of TSN that it was there was sexism? Was there racism as well? Did you were you aware of of, of any type of culture? looking back now and that that could have been changed? I wouldn't say that I noticed that at all. No, I'm not at TSN. I'm, I think that, I think if we talk about things like sexism, if you will, I think that happened in every industry at that time. I don't think it was something that was unique just to sports broadcasting. For sure. I, I mean, good gracious. Like I was the same age as a lot of these players when I started. Oh. You know, I'm in my early 20s uh we're receiving lots of uh things that there's no way you would get away with saying that today and the same things in the workforce it's not a chance would you be able to say those are or i think would the men feel comfortable to say them uh things have changed and i i don't you know i no, i can't say i ever saw any racism or i i just had my share of probably sexist comments but i think that was the same for any female in the workforce at that time Right. Did you discuss it with other females when you were working there? Gosh, you know, I, w I wish I could have. It's funny because there is a, a couple of people that would be behind the camera. So there were directors there. My goodness, directors and producers and editors that were female. Uh, and, and it's only in later years that we have actually talked about it. It's funny. Why at is that, time, do you think? I don't know, because at the time, and I was thinking about this actually even with Teresa, with, with T, we saw each other just a few years ago. And I remember thinking to myself, why didn't we talk more while we were in this? Like the challenges and the struggles of being females trying to make our way in this world. I don't, I have a feeling it just was because we were in our own way trying to survive in many ways, just trying to survive yeah. and do the best job we could. And we had a lot of pressure on us. And I think we were just, but I wish and I encourage any that are in this world today to reach out to each other and talk it out, talk it out and rant a little and vent a little. Yeah. It's so healthy, but I don't think we did that. And I also think sometimes that the networks also put us up as competing against each other. I really do. When I reflect back, I think we had these women, you have those women and you know what I mean? And they set us up, up almost in it. Well, who, who are we talking about? Who was your rival? Well, they, I didn't see it that way. Oh, I didn't see it that way. I'm just saying that I think that's maybe when I look back, I'm thinking that that maybe that's how why we didn't talk is maybe because we were we were so focused on just doing our job and doing it to the best of our ability in our at our networks. We were just trying to answer to who our bosses were, right? And just making sure that we were mm. doing what they wanted. Yeah. Mm. I've heard from many, I don't know this, but on the women's tennis tour, let's say the women's golf tour, women are less likely to hang with each other, tell stories. 
as guys would be. I'm only making that compare. Guys are more, in other words, two guys are playing tennis. They battle it out. One guy beats the other one. They're going to go for beers afterwards. Women's tour, no, more lonely. Same thing I would think in other businesses where women are the minority or they maybe do women not, uh, compared to men, hang out as much with each other? I have a feeling you've hit something on the head there that actually goes way back to a probably kindergarten. I think there's something about how women are wired in this com- in, in, when it comes to competition that they, you're absolutely right, right? Boys tend to have a little scuffle, have a little, or, or men later on, have, a, have it out and then they're fine. Exactly, go have a beer. Women are really hold on to some of that. And, and it's very interesting. I'm not a psychologist, so I can't get, get into this any deeper than the fact that women are very different that way very different in the competitive sense. I like to think that they're more, be, can, can become more like men and just have it out and now let's all get together and move on. But there's something about the way we are wired that I think does go back, you know, it's like the mean girls. Yeah. And, 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 and it really continues, see it in high school all the time, very subtly mean and, and under, you know, and, and I don't know if that then carries on into the workplace, but it's very true, but I think that is changing. I'm, I'm really pleased to see that that's changing. It seems to be there's a lot more collaboration, a lot more let's support each other. Oh yeah, lots of that. For sure. Go girl, you go girl, for sure. Yeah, exactly. And I, I love to see it. I wish that we had had that 20, 30 years ago. All I think right, it's a reflection of just the changing of, of our times and how we perceive each other and how women's places have changed in the workforce. But I had a fight when I when I was young. Like you know, my only big fight I had, I was ten in the playground. And I got the strap. <laughs> did you at least win the fight? I'd like to say I think I did. It was against a boy. <laughs> it was against a boy, right? Right on. Good for you. <laughs> okay. Before we let you go, you have to tell me about uh, Lucy uh, Tri Sports. Right. How did it come along? Um, what was the inspiration behind it, and uh, how's it going now? Well, thanks. It's, uh, it's really become a real passion project. And I think, as we've just talked about with my career, wanting to be accepted in sports broadcasting, I see there's a parallel journey for our main character, Lucy. She is looking to be accepted by boys and girls and grandparents and parents in the sports space as the lead character of a series of sports books. So very similar. And Lucy is really the inspiration came because I was covering women's hockey at the Vancouver Olympic Games My young daughter was two at the time. I was looking for books to read to her that were about different types of sport and I couldn't find anything. And I thought, hey, we could like create a collection of books that educate and inspire kids to try different types of sports. So that's why I started with the Olympic sports of luge, Lucy tries luge and short track speed skating. And, and, And then it just kind of morphed into more of the mainstream sports. And really it's all about inspiring our kids to be active to persevere, that's why it's tries. And it's so important because all kids are trying. And so if we can inspire them to be active and try different types of sport as they're learning to read and really to help with these declining physical activity rates because it is not good news. 95% of our kids right now coming out of COVID are not reaching their recommended movement guidelines. So I guess Mark, you could say this is going back to my phys ed degree, back to my sports broadcasting degree, and then becoming a mom and just really wanting to make a difference here in the health outcomes of our next generation. And Lucy is that role model. Kids relate to her. Boys love her too. Kids do not see gender. They do not see color. And so I see her impact and the value of her. And I, I can hardly wait to take her to the next level, which would be an animated space. But I have to share with you, and I know you love baseball. I do. Baseball is next. So in one year, we have Lucy Tries Baseball and our third base coach, weaving this back to the whole role of females in, in sports, the third base coach is actually inspired by Kim Ng, the general manager of the Miami Marlins. Excellent. So if oh, kids can see it, they can be it. That's what I like to say. Oh, and that's fantastic. So- that's what that's all about. Thanks for giving me the moment to share with you that passion project of mine. Oh, absolutely. Listen, I think it's fantastic. When I see all the girls, young girls at Blue Jay games, at Raptor games, at Leaf games, it does even at uh, minor games where I go, you know, I've watched a fair bit of junior B hockey this year all over Ontario. 
I think it's great. And the fact that they have opportunities that they never had before. And now books that little girls can read. And it doesn't, you know, you know, I mean, look, I'm sure that uh, all the boys stories that I read and other uh, uh, boys read when we were kids were about boys, of course. And we never thought about, you know, scrubs on skates. Why would a girl be playing hockey? So this is wonderful. Um, a former Flugan at uh, TSN, Lisa Bose. Thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. And it was, uh, and before we go, uh, Toronto Mike. I'm Toronto sure Mike right. here. Hello, Lisa. Love Lisa Bose. Uh, how you doing, Lisa? It's good to see you again. Mike, I have to say, I'm so, I forgot. Congratulations on episode late. 1000 and counting. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too late to get in on that episode. It drops next Thursday. So I, right after this, you record something and email it to me. We get Lisa Bose on episode 1000. But before, I don't want to have Lisa leave Hebsey on Sports until I ask for her opinion on something. Rosie DeMano wrote in the Toronto Star that women's hockey does not belong in the Olympics because th there are only two dominant teams and, you know, Canada just blew out Sweden today to kind of add to that. What do you think about Rosie DeMano's comments? It's interesting because I've thought about this a lot in the last couple of weeks and there are two sides to this. And I, and so I'm just going to say that I don't fully disagree with Rosie because <laughs> It is very, I was actually, when I heard that they blew out Finland 11-1 mm -hmm. last week, I think it was, yep. I actually was really, I thought, wow, I covered this team, you know, in the Olympics 12 years ago, and Finland was so much more competitive back then. And all I could think of was this game, this sport, how, isn't that too bad that they, that domestically, these other countries are not where Canada and the United States are. So when we talk about a, a competitive field, a competitive tournament, uh, it's almost, I, you know, I, I understand her point. Then on the but, flip side, though, yeah. we have people that will say, but we can't, we can't not have these teams that have worked so hard domestically, Canada, the United States, and have them not in the Olympic Games. And that when you put them on that showcase and you show the world what, what women's hockey is like at the highest level, that then the game just keeps growing for US and Canada and everyone can see the potential of it. So they want to have that showcase. They want to have that, that event. But I, 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 do, I do understand that point about about not having that competitive. But Lisa, tournament. did you, you probably missed it, but uh, last night, uh, Czech Republic almost beat the USA. Oh, I did miss that. Okay. Like, it was like, okay, it was honestly, it was close. Czech, it was, it almost, almost the upset. So there, there are moments I've noticed where other teams kind of rise up and surprise. Uh, Canada just seems so dominant, but I was very curious, what would Lisa Bose think about Rosie DeMano's uh, piece in the star? So thank you so yeah. much. Well, yeah, and I, but I see their point. I see the, the women's hockey, why they want to be at the Olympics. I get that point, but there is parts of me that wonder what can be done, though, to raise the game domestically in the other countries. And that's a whole other discussion because it's all down to culture. Yep. It's down to so many different factors that we don't have time to get into. But I, I really thought, wow, what happened to Finland and what happened to Sweden? Because they were much closer 12 years ago, 10 yeah. years ago. It's a yeah. two-team race. It's the same two, and uh, you're right. It's you know you can only watch the games, you know that that are meaningful so many times. Lisa Bose, again, thanks so much for joining us. We're sending you a lovely uh, gift pack. Nate makes soap. You're gonna love it. I don't think Ooh. you get that stuff out there. We'll have it delivered to you. It's and a long bike the, ride though. Yeah, it's a <laughs> and all the best with uh, with uh, Lucy tries sports. Lucy tries luge. Lucy tries short track speed skating. Thank you, Lisa. And, and hockey. And hockey. Basketball Basketball. and soccer. <laughs> and baseball soon. And baseball next spring. You bet. Thanks, guys. All right. Cheers. Thanks, Lisa. All right. And we don't need to even get into whether she likes the Super Bowl or anything like that. Well, one day I could see Lucy, Lucy tries UFC. Lucy <laughs> tries NFL. Uh, maybe not. Super Bowl Sunday coming up. The hype is, uh, I don't know, underwhelming, Mike, for the Super Bowl? Kind you, of? No, there's not a lot. There's more hype for that halftime show than there is for that football game. Yeah, the national anthem. There's more hype, uh, but but that's because people haven't figured out who they like yet. Unless you're a Rams fan or a Bengals fan from the beginning, yeah, which uh, there aren't two, very many. Yeah, go yeah ahead. No, these two teams, Mike, had a regular season record, a combined regular season record of 22 and 12, which means this Super Bowl matchup features the most mediocre teams of them all. Okay, if you add their playoff victories this year, the Rams are 15 and five, the Bengals are 13 and seven. Not great. This isn't like the undefeated, almost undefeated season that the Patriots had a few years ago. 
Uh, and maybe that's why betting on the game is slow with the Rams a four point favorite. The over under is at 49 and a half prop bets. Oh, I got a few country music star. Mickey Guyton will sing the national anthem and the over under on the elapsed time is one minute and 40 seconds. Normally the anthem singer goes around two minutes or more. Alicia Keys went to 35 one year. Okay. Lady Gaga went to 15 one year, but jewel went a minute and 27 seconds when she did it. And I'm thinking Mickey Guyton's going to do it in under 140. And I made a prop bet on her to do so. Also, another prop bet, whose jersey will Drake wear Saturday night when he hosts the big party in LA? The Drake curse is alive and well. Every time he supports a player or team by wearing their jersey, it seems that they lose. If he has a Rams logo on his jersey tomorrow night, you might want to go with Cincy if you believe in the curse and vice versa. Although I can't see him wearing a Bengals logo at a party in LA. Can you also, if I may remind you that yes. curse is gone because the 2019 Toronto Raptors. No, 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 the no, NBA no, champion. no, 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 not, not the same. He was a Raptors fan from the beginning. He didn't just like, jump in. Oh, you know, that's like, like, okay. no, you know what I mean? Like Kentucky basketball, he decided to jump in and they played like shit after that. Connor McGregor, he jumped in to support McGregor. McGregor lost. Uh, the soccer players. No, think about it. All the soccer players he did with. Too. Right. He jumped okay, in. I just wanted as, to point as, out his Raptors won the championship. But no, no, but he was a Raptors fan from the beginning, from the very beginning. So that does, it's not the same. Okay. He didn't, he didn't jump on the Raptors bandwagon, uh, right. get photographed with the Raptors courtside, and then they won. He, he was there from the beginning. <laughs> anyway. Um, All right. Anyway, I don't know. I don't know about this point spread. I don't know. I'll make my pick um, on Sunday, I, th I think, for my video. I like the Rams to win. Will they win by more than four? I don't know. If you bet the Rams straight up, they're at minus 195, which means you got to lay a, a $195 to make a $100 profit. And if you like the Bengals, you get plus 165. So you got, if you lay $100, you win 165 in profit. I'll take the Rams to win, probably come down to a field goal. I don't know, Mike. What about you? Who do you like? Who's your home team. team. We, 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 we've never had a home team, right? Is this the first time? No, we had it once before. We had it once before. Okay, did the home team win once before? I know I'm putting you on the spot here. You probably don't remember. Do you remember? I can't, I can't okay. remember. I think the bottom line is uh, <laughs> I'm uh, putting all my Bodog dollars on the home team. Okay, I like the Rams too. I think they should win it at home. I mean, if there's any advantage at all, it's got to be to play at home, right? So there you go. All right. Um, the Olympics, Mike, I'm still having trouble getting into the Olympic games because to me, it's like when they're competing for a medal. Okay. Preliminary stuff. I'm not nuts about so far. We got one gold medal. We got four silvers. We've got seven bronzes. And none of them have I yet. Wow. Fabulous. Run away. I, can't, I haven't gotten there yet. Hmm. Not well, yet. you're going to run out of time. It's going to be over before you get into it. So every four years, my friend, I've been watching a lot, which means I've been seeing Dan O'Toole's face on my TV screen every 4.5 minutes for the Why? last week. What do you mean? His boomsies? No. His I, podcast? I, it's not Bodog, so I don't want to give them any love because uh, I only love Bodog on this show. But uh, he's got a, a commercial that runs ad nauseum. You're obviously not watching the Olympics because you'd be, you'd be dreaming about Dan O'Toole. I saw I saw one commercial that he's doing. He looks like half a Dan O'Toole. Looks watching. like he lost uh, like a hundred pounds in his face oh, or man. something like that. He looks really, <laughs> ever since really he golfed good. with you at Crosswinds. He's well, been, I haven't. That's a while ago. No, that wasn't at Crosswinds. That was oh. at uh, Peter, Peter. That was at. Um, no, he in, looks good. People people tell me he looks like my brother, so I have to say he looks yeah. good. So but, he's uh, doing so he's doing commercials for a gambling site that doesn't right. exist yet, right? It's they right. Don't it was coming soon in April. It's coming whatever. soon. All yeah. right. Good but for him. he does. It's not that he does. They're spending money. a lot of money, boy. He's on camera more than he ever was with Jay and Dan. I, I was going to say, uh, I've never seen more Dan O'Toole. I literally wake up in the middle of the night dreaming of Dan O'Toole. <laughs> Come on. It's just getting bad out there. Because you know why? Because I'm watching so much Olympics. Like I start tuning in at about whatever, 9 p.m. I tune in or whatever until I fall asleep. And it depends what's going on. I wanted to see the flying tomato last night make his last uh, half pipe in the Olympics. And didn't, uh, even, uh, didn't even meddle. No, he didn't meddle, but he's 35 years old. Like, that's tough for him. But Go, get him was, Go find another thing to do with your life. Enough with the Olympics with you. Every four years, Hepsi. I'm sorry. Enough, to... enough, enough. Let somebody Would else have a chance. Would you be into it if it was somewhere else? Are you I don't want some old guy China? taking a job, taking a, a position from some kid, young kid. Okay? What are you talking oh, about? Well, you didn't make the Olympics. Oh, that's because that old motherfucker. He qualified. No, old. he was legit. He had a very good uh, second go. He was Enough he was is legit. enough. Go back to your games. I've had it with Sean White and all these old people. Let's go. He, he was for young qualified people, on merit, not on name. Come on. Enough is enough, please. <gasps> oh, my goodness. Enough, oh, my Sean goodness. White. We give a shit. You're, wow. You're, you're, you're Olympic overloaded. 
That's what you don't, are. It's not that you often, wouldn't, man. So you wouldn't mention anything to do with the Olympics for three fucking years. Then all of a sudden, oh, boy, Sean White. Yeah, that's what that's how the Olympics are. Yeah. Not interested. Not interested. Let me know when he wins. A goal. I'm all in, but it's Let okay, Hebs, if you're not in. You don't have it's I'm optional. not all in until I know that Canada's got a chance to win a medal. Okay? Wow. And besides that, I don't spend 18 hours American a day of you, in right? front of American. the television set. <laughs> what are you I'm talking about? 18 hours a day watching the fucking Olympics like I you are. I see your There's tweets. Other... What? You watch, it would be soccer in the morning and there's some other soccer thing. Not the you... Olympics, though. Not the Olympics, no. No, true. and you know why? Because you don't care for the Olympics. No, because I'm not engaged in this Olympics in Beijing, a place I'm not interested in visiting. Okay. No fans in the stands, not interested. There's hockey, something. couldn't give a fuck about hockey. I've got hockey to watch here, the NHL. Why would I watch Olympic hockey when I can watch the best players in the world in the NHL? End of discussion. Okay, yeah, there's more than hockey. End the of dis- women's hockey, same two teams. Let me know when they play for you the No, hey, Czech Republic almost won, and that would have Fuck meant off with America- the Czech Republic almost won. Guess what? I almost won the lottery. Almost. Woo! They Within almost a whisker won. of America, not Mike, finishing better than fifth. Mike, Mike, Within a whisker. A Who cares? Mike, the, the Americans are going to get to the final anyway. It doesn't matter what happens in the prelim. What's Who the Bodog odds on that? I'm not so sure. Who cares? I'm really honest to God. When they get a chance to win a medal, then I'll become interested. For now, it's 27 time zones away. I just got finished with the Australian Open, and I forget what else where I'm watching stuff that's 100 hours ahead of me. I don't, know you, whether to sh- I don't know whether to shit or wind my watch. What time is it? We got to go. 13 hours ahead. Listen, I'm telling you, I give you permission not to watch the Olympics, but is it okay with you if I watch the Olympics? Is that okay with you? Yeah, yeah. As long as we don't take up too much time on the show. Look at what time it is, Mike. You don't we didn't talk about it do. at all. We didn't talk about That's it at all. That's right, because there's more important things to talk about. Right? The Raptors, the Leafs, teams we follow every day. Okay. Not somebody that I don't even know what their name is. I have to wait to see if there's a Canadian flag on them to find out if they fucking won or not. By the way, wow. Okay, Phoenix Open. Top Canadian is Adam Hadwin. He's uh, five under 67 after the opening round. All right. In tennis, Felix Ogier seemed into the quarterfinals at Rotterdam in the ATP 500. And Canada's Vasek Pospisil into the quarters against the number three seed John Isner at the Dallas Open. No Canadian women in action this weekend. Medal count. One fucking gold for us. One. Let's step it up, Canada. That's it for episode 271 of Hebsey on Sports. Thanks to Toronto Mike for production, inspiration, and Olympics watching. How would I know what's going on if it wasn't for you? <laughs> Thanks to Scott Allen, uh, executive producer of the show. Thanks to our guest, Lisa Bose. Thanks to our sponsors, NateMakesSoap.com and GoodFootDelivery.com. And don't forget to gamble with me. And get in on a special deal. You get a free Hebsey on Sports t-shirt and up to $200 in betting money when you go to hebsey.online slash bodog and register with a minimum $25 deposit all the way up to $200 and bodog will match it. Okay, such a deal. Hebsey.online slash bodog. Help out the show. Appreciate your support. Thanks for allowing us into your headspace. Back with another exciting episode next week. Our guest will be... Tampa Bay Lightning play-by-play broadcaster Dave Randorf. Until then, adios, amigos. So long for now. Okay, say goodbye to the uh, faithful viewers. Turn off these cameras. Hey, uh, thanks everybody for watching. Have a wonderful week.